brain's a computer. I know it seems strange to think of the human brain as a computer, but you know, it's not a computer like your desktop or like your cell phone, which are architected systems. It's an evolved system that has developed over millions of years, continuously building on what was there before. But it processes information. You sit here, you have sensory experiences, you combine those sensory experiences with prior information, prior knowledge, you make decisions and you act in the world, and an information processing system like that is a computer. So in principle, we should be able to understand the human brain as a computer by reverse engineering it and discovering the underlying computational algorithms that govern its function. And if we do that, we can invert those algorithms and create very powerful brain decoding devices that can probably in the future replace all other kinds of brain machine interfaces and brain computer interfaces. Now, uh, the brain looks like a pretty homogeneous organ. There's a cerebral cortex, this big folded part on the top, and there's a cerebellum on the bottom. Underneath the cerebral cortex, this mantle of tissue, there are many, many subcortical nuclei. Uh, altogether, though, the brain has about something we think on the order of, say, 500 different parts. About a third of those are going to be subcortical nuclei, and uh, two-thirds of them are going to be cortical areas that are functionally and anatomically distinct. And these areas are hooked together in very dense networks. We don't really know the areas yet for humans or exactly how they're hooked together, but uh, animal studies suggest that the brain is 50% connected. That is, for any given location on the cerebral cortex, uh, it is connected to 50% of all of the other locations. And all of these connections are feed-forward and feedback. So the brain is a giant, interconnected, recurrent network. And systems like this in uh, science are known as nonlinear dynamical systems, and they have interesting properties. The property of the system as a whole, its function, cannot necessarily be predicted by looking at the individual parts, because nonlinear dynamical systems have emergent properties. And in humans, of course, one of the most important emergent properties is probably consciousness. To get a handle on what uh, the human brain is as a computer, to understand its structure, uh, we can first of all try to map it. We can separate the cerebral cortex into its distinct anatomical and functional parts and try to get a handle on them and then look at how they interact. Now, uh, people have known for hundreds of years that the human brain was divided into different functional parts. And uh, they've tried, mostly unsuccessfully until recently, to really parcelate out the cerebral cortex, the main part of the human brain that you see on the, in a slide that uh, distinguishes us mostly from lower animals. They've tried to parcelate the brain using a variety of methods that uh, were mostly unsuccessful. The most notorious of these is phrenology, a 19th century discredited science in which people tried to look at the bumps on the surface of the skull and infer from the pattern of bumps what the underlying function was of the tissue underneath the bumps. Uh, today we all laugh at this, it seems completely silly, but the phrenologists weren't completely crazy. They were they had very poor methods, they were very poor scientists, but they did have one good idea, which is that the brain is functionally localized. And today we can uh, map the functional localization of the brain using powerful methods such as functional magnetic resonance imaging. So I'm going to show you an example of an fMRI uh, experiment that kind of gives you a flavor of the kind of data we can recover from this method. The brain is inconveniently folded up inside the skull, so we computationally inflate it, and we put some slices in it, and we flatten it out. So now we're looking at the surface of the cerebral cortex. If we did this to your brain, we would have something about the size of a large pizza. There is a left and a right hemisphere. Uh, the middle of the screen is showing the visual system. At the far left and the far right is the prefrontal cortex. Now we can paint brain activity on the surface of the cerebral cortex while someone watches a movie. Uh, and they're simply passively watching this movie and interpreting what's going on. And of course, if you think about what happens in your brain when you watch a movie, anything that you can conceive of in this movie must be reflected somewhere in the brain in terms of patterns of brain activity. Obviously, uh, you can see the structure of the movie, you can see the wall, you can see water, you can see the edges of the screen, you can see textures, you can see oriented lines. Those are represented in one part of the brain. Other parts of the brain represent information that uh, and is, reflects the objects and actions in the movie. That there's a car or a smokestack, that there's smoke, uh, that there's airflow. Right? Other parts of the brain reflect information that isn't directly in the movie, but is associated with it. For example, uh, you might be hungry right now, so you might be thinking about food, 
or you might be annoyed at the price of gas, or uh, you might want coffee. All of these things would be also represented in the brain, these desires, needs, wants, and associations. All of this stuff must be represented somewhere so in the brain. So you can think of the problem of brain mapping as finding systematic relationships between the stuff in the world, in this case the things in the movie, and the patterns of brain activity. Those are going to be fairly straightforward relationships to map. There's also, of course, going to be a lot of information in the brain that isn't directly in the movie. Your implicit associations, your biases, your private, uh, prior experiences, and those are going to be a bit more difficult to map. But in principle, we should be able to slowly, over time, aggregate a huge amount of information about the relationships between brain activity and the world in order to create functional maps of the brain. So uh, here are the results of a few mapping experiments that have been aggregated together. In these experiments, we had people watch movies, or we had them listen to stories in the MRI machine. These experiments probably took uh, eight or 10 hours in total for one individual, but we didn't do this all at once. These were experiments that were done across weeks of time. Uh, and now we can take this information, uh, essentially this is a regression problem where the X variables are the world, the stories are the movies, and the Y variables are our brain activity, and we can use machine learning and data analysis tools to recover functional maps of brain activity. And those are shown here as uh, colored maps. And the different colors here reflect different kinds of meaning that are represented in the patterns of brain activity about the information in the stories and movies. Now, these patterns are fairly complicated and rich, and uh, this conceptual knowledge that we're mapping in this particular experiment is distributed broadly across the brain. This is a lot of information to take in. We're making 100,000 spatial measurements across these cortical maps, and it's too much to think about. So uh, we've created an online brain viewer that you can actually uh, play with on my website. And this online brain viewer allows you to interact with these maps to determine what kind of conceptual information is represented across the brain. So this particular data set comes from a story listening experiment where people listened to the Moth Radio Hour from Public Radio International. And now uh, we can create maps that uh, reveal what kind of information is represented at different locations in the brain. And here I'm clicking on an individual voxel uh, down in the temporal lobe on the side of the head that represents social information. Families, mothers, fathers, daughters, things that happen to families, weddings, births, deaths, and so on. There are many locations that represent social information. Here's one in the lateral prefrontal cortex that also represents social information. In fact, all of the red spots on this map represent social information. There are other networks that represent other kinds of information. For example, here's a spot in the posterior parietal cortex that represents numerical information, numbers, time, money, uh, uh, mathematical uh, equations that you might uh, uh, be processing in your brain. Anything related to numbers is represented in this network of green areas. In fact, there are networks for hundreds of different kinds of conceptual information. Every piece of conceptual information, uh, truth, dreaming, sculptures, anything you can think of, uh, these conce concepts are represented in multiple locations across the surface of cortex, and uh, each potential, each location on the cortex represents multiple kinds of information. Now, of course, brains aren't all the same. Uh, you know, everyone has the same ears, everyone has the same ear bits, but everybody's ears look slightly different, and it's the same for brains. Everyone's brain is essentially the same in its general form, but all individual brains are different. And uh, we can aggregate data across different brains, like we see here. We can see that about a third of the functional activity in brains is shared across individuals, and about two-thirds reflects individual differences, which are both developmental and experiential differences uh, that are reflected in function. Now, even though there are individual differences in the brain, because the brain is essentially a collection of wires, which are the nerves that connect different areas together, there's a very strong relationship between the structure of the brain and the function of the brain. And by aggregating data across many subjects and using computational modeling methods, we can create a mathematical model that links an individual brain anatomy to the distribution of function across that brain. Uh, here we show one particular functional map for one individual who's listening to stories, and this is a conceptual map. This is uh, mapping uh, 2,000 different kinds of objects and actions that can occur in stories across one individual brain. There are about 160 uh, different brain areas that represent conceptual knowledge in these stories, and we can do this for any individual. Now, up to now, I've suggested to you uh, that the brain is static, that different places in the brain represent a certain small constellation of quantities, and that 
those representations are static. In fact, they're not. Uh, the way the brain is designed, it, there are emergent properties uh, that arise as a consequence of the task that you are trying to perform that actually change the way that information is represented in the brain. So uh, this is data from a simple experiment where we have people passively watching movies versus attending to humans in the movies versus attending to vehicles in the movies. And you can see that the conceptual maps in these three different cases are different. And actually, the maps vary the least in the visual system. Uh, these functional maps vary enormously in prefrontal cortex uh, because prefrontal cortex represents abstract thought, plans, goals, cons uh, things like that. And as you change your task, the uh, activity in prefrontal cortex actually represents different kinds of quantities. So for example, if you lose your cat, your prefrontal cortex becomes a giant cat detector. And all other functions are, are suppressed, and you, everything is trying to represent cats as much as it can. And that is true for pretty much any tasks you perform. Now, the, one of the interesting things about these encoding models, if you're just a civilian and not a neuroscientist, is that once you have a computational model of the brain that relates uh, the world to brain activity, you can invert that model, and you can convert your encoding model into a decoding model, and you can use it to decode brain activity. And in fact, there's an inevitable symmetry between brain encoding and brain decoding, such that whenever we can create a better computational model of the brain, we can always, by definition, build a better brain decoder. And oftentimes, it's a little easier to understand what kind of information we can recover from current brain measurements uh, by looking at decoders. So I'd like to show you a few of these as examples. Uh, here's one brain decoder that's only recovering information from primary visual cortex, a very early visual area that represents uh, very simple aspects of the scene, like edges and textures and colors. On the upper left is the movie we showed to subjects. On the upper right is information we're decoding from primary visual cortex. And the bottom two uh, photos show you the edge maps. These should correspond well, because we know that this part of the brain represents edges. Here's a decoder that is recovering information and decoding it from high-level visual areas. These visual areas, they don't really carry a lot of information about the specific structure of a scene, the distribution of surfaces and colors and textures. They carry information about the content of the scene, what people were present, were there objects present, the, the semantic information in the scene. And you can see that this decoder also works fairly well. Uh, it doesn't do well when the scene changes very rapidly, like right now, because these MRI changes that we are measuring are metabolic, not neural, and they are fairly slow. But uh, when the scene changes slowly, the decoder does uh, quite a good job of recovering information about the semantic content of the scene. So where is this technology going? Well, the analogy I like to make is with early photography. This is the very first photograph that was taken by Joseph Nietzsche in the south of France in the early 19th century. And uh, this is a bad photograph, right? No one would pay for this photograph. But you can see that it is a photo. There are walls, there's a horizon, there's a roof. You can tell it's maybe some sort of farm scene or a village scene. It is a photograph. And this photograph launched an entire industry uh, that sought to develop photography into what we have today, where photography is so ubiquitous and of such high quality that no one even wants to pay for it. They expect to just get it for free on their cell phones. Right? And brain decoding will uh, pursue this same trajectory. As long as the government uh, is investing in neuroscience and neuroscientists are working to understand the brain, they'll be developing new methods of measurement. Those new brain measurement methods will allow us to create more sophisticated computational models of the brain, and those computational models will allow us to decode brain activity with much higher fidelity. So at some point in the future, uh, we're going to have very cheap, very powerful, portable brain decoding devices. That we're not there yet. Uh, as I mentioned at the beginning of this talk, the brain is a nonlinear dynamical system. And one of the important properties of these systems is that in order to understand the entire uh, dynamical surface, the sort of dynamical landscape, you need to record in both space and time at very high resolution simultaneously. But right now, we don't have any methods that allow us to record in both space and time. All the methods we have either uh, sacrifice time or they sacrifice space. So for example, functional MRI, the method that I showed you earlier in the talk, it has fantastic spatial resolution, but very poor temporal resolution because it measures metabolic signals, changes in blood flow that are consequent to neural activity. It doesn't measure changes in neural activity itself. So MRI cannot really recover any dynamic information. 
a very common consumer method that is used to uh, measure and decode brain activity today is electroencephalography, EEG. And EEG has fantastic temporal resolution, but it has horrible spatial resolution. So although it can measure events happening in time, it does not know where those events came from in the brain. So all the different maps that occur in the brain get all essentially mixed together, and this is reduces the amount of information we can decode from EEG to just a few bits. But we do know that uh, brain measurement improves all the time because neuroscience community is very focused on improving measurement since measurement limitations are the main factor we have limiting our progress in neuroscience today. So in the future, we are going to end up with better brain measurement methods that will recover information in both space and time and at a high resolution. We don't know when this is going to happen. It could be a decade, it could be 20 years, it could be 50 years down the road, but at some point, probably in the lifetimes of young people here, there will be a brain decoding method that is cheap, portable, very powerful, and that will become ubiquitous. People will, you know, be able to just wear a brain hat around and have their internal thoughts decoded all the time. And this would have a very profound effect on society. After all, how do I interact with my computer today? I use these meaty thumbs that were evolved billions of years ago, millions of years ago, and it's kind of insane for me to interact with my cell phone with my thumbs when I have a very good internal speech, a little man in my head that's talking to me continuously, and it could just interact with my cell phone directly. In fact, anything that is going on in your head is potentially decodable. All of your inner thoughts, your intentions, desires, your attitudes, in fact, things you haven't even, that haven't even reached conscious awareness yet are potentially decodable. And all that information will be decoded using future brain decoding technology. Now, that's both exciting and, frankly, quite scary because you can imagine all the ethical issues that this will open up. After all, Americans in particular, but humans in general, are pretty bad about guarding their privacy. And there are real uh, interesting privacy and ethical issues that are going to be opened up when Google and Facebook have access to all of your innermost thoughts with no filter from your thumbs. Right? That's going to be a very strange world, but it is the world we're going to live in very soon. Thank you for your time.